Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! But we begin with Brexit, and, well, I say, what a strange place we've become. If you are, I, I say this a lot, but today it's ten times truer than it usually is. If you are kind enough to listen to this programme on a regular basis, you will have been utterly unsurprised by what happened in Salzburg yesterday. You can't have, unless of course you think that I am a gibbering idiot who talks undiluted nonsense, which is a perfectly reasonable position to have adopted, except for the fact that over the course of the last two and a half ish, uh, years on all Brexit-related issues, I have endured the horrible, horrible experience of being proved right about things I wish weren't true on every single issue, okay? And it's not a particular reflection of any intelligence or perspicacity on my part. It's simply a, a realisation quite soon after, or possibly before the vote to leave the European Union, that most people persuaded that it was a thing that we should leave had very, very little understanding of what it actually was. And most of the things they portrayed as negatives or pejoratives were either not true or not entirely accurate. So we reached a place quite quickly where it became clear that the people possessed of the strongest opinions regarding the European Union, and they would all be leavers, you very rarely came across anyone who you describe as being passionately pro-Remain, but we very quickly established by talking to more Leave voters um, than any other person in the British media on a daily basis, we quickly established that none of them really knew what they'd voted for. And that's not an insult or a criticism. It's the fault of the snake oil salesman and the liars. So we established very quickly that the strongest opinions regarding the European Union, and this holds true from, from the upper echelons of British politics right down to the shop floor of British factories, the strongest opinions were held by the people with the least understanding of what the European Union actually was. And that is a tragedy on one level, but it's also a crime of journalism. It's an epic failure of journalism, but as we've observed a thousand times on this programme, and as the Sun newspaper once again proves today, um, e EU, you dirty rats with uh, Tusk and Macron made up to look like Hollywood gangsters, they don't care about the truth. Tony Gallagher, the editor of the Sun newspaper, does not give a monkeys about the truth. He ran a story earlier this week about some Russian model being poisoned by Putin in an Italian restaurant in Salisbury, which looks increasingly as though it may have been a complete hoax. So that man who publishes, who edits that newspaper, Tony Gallagher is his name, he does not care about the truth. All he cares about is eliciting an emotional reaction from you. He is, if you like, a, a kind of master of fake news. So today, how is he going to make you angry um, about the wrong things and how is he going to make you get cross with the wrong people instead of getting cross with all the charlatans and fraudsters who persuaded you that leaving the European Union would be easy and that we'd um, effortlessly secure an arrangement that was superior to the status quo. Well, he's just going to portray two people that you know very little about as gangsters and claim that somehow what happened to Theresa May in Salzburg yesterday was their fault rather than his. Of course, I suppose in his defence we should say that when Rupert Murdoch says jump, he just tugs his forelock and says, how high, boss? So... Fact number one, people with the strongest opinions about the European Union have turned out to be the people with the least understanding of it. That leads us to yesterday, when it became absolutely clear that these people with the strongest opinions but the poorest understanding have now got two very simple choices. Very simple choices. Either they admit that they were wrong about almost everything, OK? That's a big ask for anybody. You, you, I, I was wrong about almost everything. When I said it would be the easiest deal in human history, when I said absolutely nobody is talking about leaving the single market, when I said only a madman would leave the single market, when I said they need us more than um, we need them, when I said the German car industry won't allow uh, anything bad to happen, when I said we'll be able to... I saw the UKIP character, the absolute... What an absolute balloon this Gerard Batten bloke is. He quoted in the Financial Times saying, oh, what we'll be very easily able to do is to opt out of freedom uh, on uh, the four pillars. We'll be able to opt out of freedom of movement, but stay on the other three, um, movement of uh, services, trade, goods, whatever. I just said it. 
and, and thought, and he still has the audacity to appear on national media. So they were wrong about absolutely everything. Daniel Hannan, John Redwood, Gerard Batten, Nigel Farage, Boris Johnson, Michael Gove. Uh, you, you carry on making the list. So wh where are they today, right? They now have a very simple choice. They either admit they were wrong or they pretend because they must know now. Surely even the most bovine and idiotic of Brexiteer must now know that the people on the other side were right about everything. They just must. Oh, we'll get a deal. Well, yeah, you won't, though, because third country status, indivisible pillars of the four freedoms, Good Friday Agreement. These aren't opinions. These are established facts. These are formal and codified contracts that you didn't read and perhaps still haven't. The economic impact assessments, their predictions and speculations, the Good Friday Agreement isn't. Good Friday Agreement is a binding contract. The EU's constitution and, and the way it will treat a third country has been established since, well, long before the Brexit vote, but in the context of the United Kingdom's decision to leave, it's been pretty clear since July 2016. So this is their choice. Either they go, crikey, I have built my entire career on jingoistic ignorance. My entire career, John Redwood, Ian Duncan Smith, Daniel Hannan, has been built on jingoistic ignorance. This thing I've spent my entire life attacking doesn't actually exist. This thing I've dedicated my entire professional existence to criticising and condemning doesn't resemble what I thought it was in any way, shape or form. I... I I've, I've spent my whole life talking undiluted gibberish. And then, on top of that, you have presumably the dawning realisation. Somewhere inside, there must be a little voice going, y y you've ruined your country. Oh, my God. I Let's give them the benefit of the doubt, OK? They thought that they were doing what was good for Britain. They know now they're not. So they're choosing now between loyalty to the country or a form of face saving and it's only a postponement the face saving it, it, it can't be permanent because eventually reality is going to bite everybody on the backside so they now have a choice there he is on the telly john redwood the man who advised investors in a in a fund a firm that pays him a six-figure salary to get their money out of britain post Brexit. but there he is on your telly right now banging on about the usual nonsense oh we'll be fine ian duncan smith on the telly this morning let's just get on with it get on with what you Balloon will be my insult of the day, as you may have already noticed. So that's the choice they've got, OK? Admit they were wrong about everything and that their entire careers were built on jingoistic freedom, jingoistic ignorance, or double down. So what happened yesterday will have surprised nobody who understands the issue. The only thing that was slightly surprising was the timing. And perhaps the brusqueness of it, the, the, the sense that for the EU27, patience has now just run out. Been sitting there waiting for this magical solution that the Brits are going to come up with for the Irish border or for the um, uh, uh, checking of goods going in and out of our country. They're going to come up with it. We, we, we get, we've got something, lads. Stay patient, lads. We'll come up with something. We really, and yesterday, patience ran out. The clever money suggested that this roadblock was not going to appear until October. But, you know, um, who's tracking the clever money in this country. Read a French newspaper or a German newspaper and y you'll be looking at an alternative reality. Emmanuel Macron yesterday clearly been listening to Plasticians' Brexit beats, which samples me pointing out that all of the con men who told you to do it ran away the next day. Word for word, Emmanuel Macron. Front page of the day's Daily Telegraph. Brexit is the choice of the British people, pushed by those who predicted easy solutions. These people are liars. Now it's impossible to argue otherwise unless you've turned your blinkers up to 11, OK? Because the only other alternative is to somehow try to pretend that what happened in Salzburg yesterday is uh, evidence of the EU's intransigence and intractability. And make no mistake, that is where they have to go next. Because what's the alternative? Oh, I was wrong about everything and my entire career was built on jingoistic ignorance. Have I got any other options? Yes, you could pretend to believe that what happened yesterday was optional, that what happened yesterday was avoidable, and that what happened yesterday was somehow evidence of intractability and intractability on the part of the European Union. Oh, are those really my only choices? Well, if you're really thick, you could just stand on the sidelines and start shouting about how the European Union is going to collapse any day now, and that's why we'll be better off out of it. 
but I presume that the people who get paid to appear on television rather than the people who queue up to get eviscerated by me on the radio are not going to be dumb enough to actually claim that the European Union is about to collapse tomorrow so we have to get out now. So you've got two options. You either admit your whole life has been a terrible, terrible mistake and that's only your professional life. Go home, be nice to your children, stroke your pets, hang out with your friends if you've got any left. Seriously, it's only your job that has been built on absolute nonsense. Or you carry on lying, you carry on pretending, you carry on driving with your eyes shut towards a cliff edge. <sighs> and we know what they're going to do, don't we? Oh, this is proof that the EU are absolutely intractable. This is proof that they're determined to punish us. But they're doing what they've said they'd do all along. Yes, but we... <laughs> oh, oh, um, fish. Blue passport. Um, um... Oh, it's your fault. It's your fault, you Remainers. You people with your pesky facts and your evidence and your understanding and your intelligence and your proofs. That's why it's all gone wrong. The European Union would have given us our unicorns if you hadn't kept insisting that unicorns didn't exist. The only reason why my unicorn hasn't been delivered yet is because you kept telling them that unicorns didn't exist. And if you hadn't kept telling them that unicorns didn't exist, we'd all have got our unicorns by now. And that is what they're going to do to you next. They already started. Oh, it's all the EU's fault. It was utterly unavoidable what happened yesterday. The plan could never work. We will not come out of the European Union with anything superior to what we have in it. It's a flawed institution. It's an imperfect institution. It's a sclerotic institution in places. But in terms of Britain's options on the international stage, from trade to security to just about every other aspect of international cooperation, it is far and away the best available deal. But if I'd spent 30 years pouring poison into your innocent ears, claiming that it was the Fourth Reich, or claiming that it was somehow an enemy of British interests, or claiming that it was somehow dedicated to forwarding causes that were detrimental to the United Kingdom. If I had spent 30 years lying through my teeth to you, do you think today I'd be able to turn around and just say, oh, sorry about that, I think I might have got things a bit wrong? The only mystery left is why people in this profession, in journalism, intelligent, educated people can continue to deny reality. I have wondered a few times over the last couple of years whether or not, as, as the evidence mounted, I've, I've wondered a couple of times whether or not, maybe, look, maybe the emperor is wearing a flesh-coloured body stocking. Maybe it's not as black and white and as clear as it seems to be to me that this is a, a, an absolute catastrophe built upon lies, exaggerations and jingoistic ignorance. Maybe there is something else out there. I've told you before, one of my best friends on the planet voted to leave the European Union because of some quite noble vision of 19th century style um, uh, trading. And, and, and I've, I've stared and stared and stared at the story for so long that my eyes have sometimes felt as if they're on stalks. But that's my job. I do it so that you don't have to. And because I have done that so that you don't have to, if you have listened to this programme for uh, a couple of years, you will be among the least surprised people on the planet. Unless you are, of course, still scrunching your eyes shut, putting your fingers in your ears, putting pencils up your nose, putting underpants on your head, shouting wibble, 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 wibble as the evidence and the truth mounts, and somehow claiming that things could have gone differently from how they have gone. It's incredible what we've done. And I think it's about to get worse. 03456060973 is the number that you need. What's the question? How have so many people ended up believing so many lies? And when the evidence becomes irresistible that you've been conned, what is it that makes you run crying to the con man instead of saying thank you to the people who finally helped you pull the wool from your eyes? I, I should also doff, doff my cap or give a little wave to, to, to the gammon today because it's, it's fascinating to see how quickly they've gone from ha, 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 I love listening to James have his meltdowns about Brexit, ha, 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 I'm so glad I voted leave, ha, 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 ha. Um, no, not anymore. Now it's please stop talking about it. For God's sake, shut up. Oh, my goodness me, stop talking. And so it's almost as if 
That bloke holding up the mirror. You hate what you see in it. It's all your fault. It's all the bloke holding up the mirror's fault. Not the face staring into it. Here is David Davis. There will be no downside to Brexit, only a considerable upside. Pick a side. Go on, him or me. Here is Michael Gove. The day after we vote to leave, we hold all the cards and we can choose the path we want. How's that working out for you, Govester? John Redwood. Getting out of the EU can be quick and easy. The UK holds most of the cards. No, no, they don't. Project Fair, shut up, sit down, traitor. No, they really don't hold most of the cards. We really, really will not be the dominant partner in these negotiations. Liam Fox. The FTA that we will do with the EU should be one of the easiest in human history. <sighs> Douglas Carswell. Remember him? You don't. You're lucky. I think we could very easily get a better trade deal than we have at the moment. How's that working out for you? Because all the people that said you were talking twaddle, that was Project Fear, remember? And finally, this Gerard Batten character who lingers on the... Uh, it lingers on the air of British politics like a really, really stubborn fart. Trade relations with the EU could be sorted out in an afternoon over a cup of tea. How has the penny not yet dropped? What is it, if not an absolutely pathological refusal to accept reality because it would involve surrendering years of pungent opinion and, in the cases of these six, entire careers built on jingoistic ignorance. Oh, happy days. Ian's in Leeds. Ian, what's going on? Yeah, what's going on indeed. Um, I don't know if you've ever received a scam letter, like a fake lottery or um, one of these uh, Nigerian 409 scams. Yes, of course I have. Uh, yeah, well, I'm sure a lot of people have in the past, and I have uh, myself about, oh, going back, to, about going back to the 90s. And people who receive, some people who receive these, uh, these letters, these documents, don't realise it's a con. But if you as a friend or relative try and explain that it is a con, that it is a scam, they're angry at you yes. rather than the perpetrator they are. They're, of yes. the scam. That's right. Because, because they don't want to be called stupid or run the risk of being called stupid, greedy or gullible. So they're angry at you. Before the scammer. But that makes no sense to you and me. It, it would make sense, I suppose, to, to people who've been through it. Uh, it it's, a, it's a denial of reality. It's a postponement of admission, right? And, and the, 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 the more that you've lost, the harder it becomes to admit that you've made a terrible mistake, which is why the people with 30, 40 years' worth of careers that have now been utterly, utterly rubbished are going to be the ones least likely to turn around and admit that they've got it all horribly wrong. I don't get it psychologically. Surely you'd want, well, you'd want to cut your losses and start rebuilding as soon as possible. You'd want to stop sending money to a mysterious bank account in Ulaanbaatar as soon as possible. You certainly would, but then I think some of the names that you've read out, there's also an element of self-interest as well. Uh, and I think that muddies the waters as far as the argument is concerned because um, many of the people, they're not going to be in a position of the, um, you know, in the days of old, when you had a, a general or a king who was prepared to go uh, lead his men from the front and run the risk of taking a bullet or a spear as much it's as general, he... It's General Melcher in Blackadder, isn't it? It's, 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 and if your exactly. stupid plan doesn't work, carry on doing it until it does. It's, um, it's quite they're, remarkable. Yeah, they're going to be 50, 50 kilometres behind the front line, you know, eating Philip steak... Sipping fine claret and smoking a fat cigar. <laughs> well, that, they might be, but there's, there's plenty. There's plenty of like, this dreadful phrase, ordinary people. Um, there's plenty of people who won't be sipping claret and smoking a fat cigar, or, 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 or cashing in the dividends on their Dublin-based funds, or drawing down their salaries for advising investors to get their money out of Britain. Jacob Rees Mogg and John Redwood. Yes, I am co completely looking at you. There's plenty of ordinary people who might lose their jobs in in the car industry, or who might see their food prices go up, and they still, I, in many ways, they interest me more. Not so much the gammon, because the contortions they've had to undertake, even to stay conscious, defy description, I think, to ordinary people. We lost, you, you lost, get over it. No, mate, we, we all lost. It's just some of us are bright enough to realise. But for decent people who voted, who are still... Well, not like Anthony. This is from Anthony. I voted leave as I bought into the BS I was fed. I'm embarrassed by myself that I didn't educate myself, but at the time the Remainers didn't tell us the full S-word mess we would be in. They did, mate, but we, it got shouted down. And I wish I could go back and change my vote, love the show. There's, there's millions of people that are a long, long, long way away from Anthony's honesty and, and intelligence. That's the bit I don't get. 
Well, unfortunately, I think there's far too much um, deference in this country with yes. regards to people like your Jake Bruce Monks and your Ian Duncan Smith. And it makes me wonder that, you know, if they, sa- if they sounded more like John Prescott or Dennis Skinner, I wonder how far they would get. Uh, well, as you know that that's a theory I, I've burnished and, and examined at great length myself. I, I think you're absolutely right, obviously. Uh, it's Dov Cap, Tug Forlock, they've got a posh accent, so they must be... They must be kosher territory. Um, but that, that's the point, isn't it? I, I mean, we know why they can't admit that they've made a mistake, because that would involve declaring their entire careers to have been built on jingoistic ignorance. But there's no shame in having believed them. There really isn't. I mean, Anthony, don't beat yourself up. There's no shame in having believed them. And yesterday proved that every single element of intelligent, informed analysis was accurate. And their choice, therefore, becomes pretend that it isn't, pretend that the EU was ever going to do anything differently from what it did, pretend that the Good Friday Agreement doesn't exist, pretend that the four freedoms that are famously indivisible are not actually indivisible. I I don't, I mean, psychologically, I don't actually get it. I'm not as sanguine as you, Ian. It's come, it's half past ten already. Sorry, I'll get some more calls on the board after this and possibly stop sharing with you the pearls of my wisdom. Although, if more people had bought my pearls of wisdom over the course of the last two and a half years, then yesterday would have come as a surprise to precisely nobody. Precisely nobody. Number you need to help, one phone line free, the one that Ian is vacating, could be yours for the price of a phone call. 0345 6060 973 is the number that you need. And remember, later in the programme, we move on to the even more serious question of whether or not foxes really do kill cats. You can email me, you can text me, or you can tweet at Mr James OB with your thoughts on just how we have allowed ourselves to be so violently and viciously conned while significant swathes of our fellow men and women remain convinced that they are going to get $30 million out of a dead oil executive's bank account by Christmas or indeed that their unicorn is going to come galloping up the garden path before tea time tomorrow. Where the, what is it, the thin gruel of saying I told you so has rarely felt less nourishing and sustaining than it does today. Please, please, please let me be wrong about something regarding Brexit. Please let the Emperor turn out to be wearing a flesh-coloured body stocking after all. Because if he really is as naked as we've increasingly concluded on this programme over the course of the last two and a half years, then the fact that half the crowd is still shouting its admiration for his luscious ermine robes becomes a a cause for, for, I mean, almost national concern, doesn't it? Riddle me this. Steve's in Benfleet. Steve, what would you like to say? Uh, morning, James. Hello, uh, I just wanted to call up and say uh, I voted leave originally. I was kind of sitting on the fence, but um, I voted leave. Uh, main reason, down to immigration. Not because I didn't want any more people coming in, but I've got a lot of uh, customers and clients from different parts of the world, and I see all the hoops they jump through. So I thought if we could have a very simplistic immigration system where everyone has to jump through the same hoops, it would be good for everyone. Um, since listening to your show, being more well informed, I would change my mind. I'd vote remain, but I, I still I feel like I'm suffering from a little bit of a kind of a Stockholm syndrome. I, I'm I hear everything you say about, obviously, Boris Johnson, yeah. obviously the lies he's told throughout his career, uh, and same with all the other lead Brexit figures. Uh, but every time you kind of see a glimpse of him on the TV, you just think, oh, he's a good guy. And I, I can't explain it. I can't, all, the, all the kind of rational reason in the world, uh, I will remain next time. It, well, if, 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 there's no guarantee we'll get a chance to do that, Steve. But I think, I think, I think, and I, and I don't want to put words into your mouth, but you've just nailed the difference, really, haven't you, between comforting lies and, and uncomfortable truth. So I can't even think of someone who, who would appear on the other side of that equation you've just described. You've got Boris's, you know, clubbable but utterly fraudulent bonhomie on one side, assuring you that yeah. everything's going to be great, your unicorn. I mean, do you know what the phrase was that sums up the problem you've just described? When, he's, w- when he said, we'll, we can have our cake and eat it. Yeah. Every child knows that that's a figure of speech designed to point out the impossibility of something and yet he with a straight face and there is something about him that makes it plausible but part of the problem is I don't know who I'd put on the other end of the seesaw do you see what I mean who's the person on the other end who can charm you and persuade you and and warm you there isn't anyone really no exactly I I did did a lot of kind of research into it mate I felt like also the other thing in front of you goes back to the old argument of the well the old argument new argument of kind of the social media algorithms I found myself obviously following Boris Johnson. I was like, I think I'm going to vote Leave. Yeah. And all of a sudden, I've got kind of Daniel Hanna on my Facebook. I'm watching videos about him lecturing at university yeah. um, from people from UKIP. And all of a sudden, I'm going down further down this rabbit hole 
I got to the point where I basically I deleted everything political off my Facebook, and I was like, right, I'm back to the centre. I ended up listening to LBC. I had a change of car, and I thought, I've got changed my radio station. Started listening to balance arguments on both sides. I thought, well, hold on a bit. I haven't really seen anything. And yeah. then I started looking at the other side. I started trying to, even though I'm quite centralist, I started going down the other rabbit hole. So on my Facebook page, I started adding people like Momentum. In my <laughs> eyes, I think they're a bit crazy. But then you start seeing where every, where all these rabbit holes lead to. And I think, I thought, I've actually been fed quite a big lie here. But the really strange thing is, I've made that important decision that I've been kind of lied to. Mm. But I still have a soft spot for them, and I can't put my finger on it. No, I really, can't. Really I, I, I get it. I do. I, I mean, if, if everyone was honest as you, we'd be fine, I think, because you, you're describing cognitive dissonance. You're, you're describing yeah. a bit like I feel with religion. Is that I, I mean, I would really struggle to prove any of it, but I still, in my heart, really like it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, mate. <sighs> Take it easy, Steve. Mind how you go, won't you? <laughs> All right. Ten thirty-eight is the time. Uh, Christians in Stuttgart, which is in Germany, so some of you may get an attack of the vapours at the, at the idea of us speaking to someone in Germany. Ooh, Christian, are you awful? Hello. Hello. How are you? I'm fine. I, I'm actually a Briton living in Stuttgart. Oh, thank God for that. Oh, thank years. God for that, honestly. <laughs> I mean, an actual German, that would have been too much. Oh, of course, we're allowed to marry them. But well, we're not actually, allowed to actually take them seriously politically. I think that's the... How actually, you... I am a German, James, oh. as well. Oh, oh my <laughs> God! You're like some sort of changeling. You're like, you're like some sort of... Some, some, what did you ring to tell me? Uh, I've, of course, been following this very closely over the last couple of years. And uh, living in Germany, I sort of see it from a different perspective. Because uh, I'm constantly... Bored. By the messages you are just going to, your the, phone line's not great, Christian. I, I'm just going to try and fix okay. it if I can. If we can, can we try and do something about that? Because I, I don't, if I'm missing every third word, um, uh, I'll, I'll head over to Liverpool briefly. Uh, Graham's there. Graham, what made you pick up the phone today? <laughs> Hi, um, I just wanted to call up about, I mean, this is going to sort of go along with what your other callers have said about cognitive de dissonance and not wanting to be wrong but there's something deeper with brexit because don't forget for a lot of people in their lives this is the first ever time they've made a vote the fact they've put their vote down on the ballot paper and it's actually made a difference all their lives they've never had a meaningful vote this is the first time they did something and they won i i, I kind of understand that I, I mean for me it's very important to point out here that the, the the constituency that really delivered brexit was wealthy pensioners in the southeast it, it wasn't these mythical horny-handed sons of the soil who felt that they'd been left behind or dispossessed that was a myth put out by oh i don't know billionaires like the ones that owned the ritz hotel and the daily telegraph um, yeah absolutely so, I, I, I agree with you so I, 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 there might be some people but, but who who really i think there's a sense of of the politicians or what, what are we going to call them experts metropolitan elites whatever these meaningless phrases a perception that they're somehow in charge and living the life of riley and my life's a bit rubbish so i'm going to vote opposite to what they want even even though it might make my life even worse i'm going to derive some weird frisson of vicarious pleasure out of thinking that they're really cross and you're right i get i mean my inbox is full of that every day ha 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 i've chopped my arms off and you're really upset about it ha 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 that that's the people <laughs> you're talking about now but the fact is that for a lot of people, there's, there's a lot of psychology about addiction, which is kind of the same mechanism in your brain as falling in love. Right. Stay with me for a second on this, because I will. you think about it, why do you get addicted to drugs or cigarettes? Well, they've got chemicals in which are addictive. Okay. Yes. Why do people get addicted to gambling? Why do people get addicted to sex? Why do people get addicted to Pokemon Go? It's because it's firing off those same sort of neurons in the brain that are associated with love. And we've had done this Or, or, or dopamine. Do, do, dopamine hits, yeah. isn't it? The, the it no, makes do... people feel good about themselves. But... And so when you talk to Brexiteers or Brexiters, um, it's a bit like saying to them, you're going out with a wrong gun. You know, your missus is a nutter. And they look at you and they're like, how dare you? You know, this is the person I love. This is the person. I... And, and it's almost as though they're in an abusive relationship. And everyone else can see it but they can't because they're too close to it but isn't there it's um that defines them. It, it, there's also a, i mean there's there's a category error here as well there's a division between the two of us that that between the two sides for want of a better word that is insuperable because you, you you're looking at something that is just a a mode of trading a mode of of supranational cooperation it's 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 relatively innocuous flawed and imperfect but on the well, other side it's 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 a monster it's a dragon it's nazis know, it's the fourth coming, right 
James, you're coming to this from a position of, of knowledge, expertise and facts. The other people that we're, we're talking to are coming at it from pure emotion. I like to say that the, the Brexit vote was a crime of passion. Yes. The, 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 and there's no getting through to people if you just try and fact them. It, you know, like I say, if you just say to someone, your missus is a nutter, why don't you go out with somebody else? And then you present them, the EU, which yeah. is someone that they would never, ever go out with or date in a million years. Do you know, years, Eva, to, to go, borrow, oh, I'm going to run with your analogy, and, and this happened in 1991 in, uh, in Chilton Come Hardy <laughs> in Manchester, where I, I, I was walking home and I saw a bloke beating up who I presumed was his wife in the front garden of his house. And, I, and I, I, I sort of, in my very ineffective way, tried to suggest that he stopped. And it was yeah. the woman that turned around and screamed yeah. abuse at me, told me to mind yeah. my own effing business. That's what it's... So you're yeah. saying to... Look, you're getting battered. And they get crossed yes. with the person who tells them. That's my yes. life, mate. That's my because, career there. Because, because whatever <laughs> dopamine is firing off in their heads... <laughs> That's associated with love and associated with addiction. They're now associated with Brexit. So can I give some advice to your listeners out there who've got friends and colleagues and relatives who've voted to leave? Yes, I know, I know what it's going to be. Buy James O'Brien's book. It's out on November the 1st. No, no, no. Don't, uh, buy buy my book, Man of the World, Graham Hughes. It's really good. <laughs> no, <laughs> no um, take them down to the pub or, or the cafe. Sit down with them and have a heart-to-heart. -heart. Don't just shout things at them on Facebook. Don't call them an idiot. Take it from the point of view that, that you know... Like Steve, out with like, like, like the caller before you, who's, who's managed to find that sort of counsel on, on, on this programme, because you're not calling all levers thick. The only levers that you're calling thick are the ones that are thick. The ones that aren't thick are not being addressed when you talk about thick people. Graham, I'm just snuck in at the end there, my realisation that he is, of course, one of the three men in a pub making that brilliant um, uh, podcast, vlogcast, or whatever it may be. And I think you're off to Gibraltar next, are you, Graham? Is that right? Yeah, we're, we've been invited by the government of Gibraltar to go over and talk to them. We were in Geneva last week, and I just want to say to you, you know how bad you think Brexit's going to be? Yeah. If you have a no deal, it's going to be worse. Much, much worse. We have literally every country in the world queuing up to sue our government as soon as it happens because when you've got a company like Nissan that's invested heavily in Sunderland, they're going to turn around to the Japanese government and say, hey, our profits are down because the British government did this Brexit thing. Like, oh, okay, we'll, we'll take them to an international dispute at the WTO. And everyone's going to do it. So because the, the terms, the terms and conditions in place when we opened our factory have been deliberately yes. changed by the British yes. government. So it's a breach, yes. it's a breach of contract in, in, yeah. in some sort of way. Breach of contract in international law. And it's like every country in the world. Is uh, going to be, uh, the I, uh, we could be spending on uh, the NHS and education. It's going to be spent on lawyers defending us from being sued at the WTO. Great. That is your opinion, Graham, I, and I have in the past found your opinions to be well informed, but I'm quite happy to admit at this stage in proceedings that I am ignorant of what you describe. Um, if anybody wants to uh, confirm or um, uh, uh, approach Graham's position, they are always welcome to do so. The number you need, and you might need to write this down, 0345 6060973 is the number you need if you want to challenge the almost unanimous suggestion that the people who told you it was going to be really, really easy, that we'd have our cake and eat it, that we'd be in the sunny uplands, that only a madman was talking about leaving the single market, that it would be the easiest deal in human history, that we could have it all sorted by tea time, that the EU needed us more than we needed them, that the German car industry would never countenance anything that might harm their commercial interests, that the three million European Union citizens living here would not have their rights changed in any meaningful form, that the one million British citizens living in the European Union would be able to carry on living just as normal. All of the people who told you that have been utterly unmasked as liars. If you want to ring me and tell me why you still trust them, I will make you feel more welcome than the most welcome person in the land of welcomes. Dear James, please carry on this conversation after 11 o'clock. It's making me feel curiously better. <laughs> Thank you. Um, a lot of praise coming in for Steve as well, which is uh, perfectly, uh, perfectly right. It, I mean, it, it, I know more than anyone how hard it is to admit that you're wrong. I find it almost preternaturally impossible to admit that I'm wrong. I'm one of those idiots who will end up arguing with some, not on air anymore, thank goodness, but back in the day at school, I, I would argue so furiously that I'd end up thinking, well, 
claiming to have won an argument because we'd ended up arguing about whether or not the person I was arguing with actually said something during the argument that they turned out not to have said. So you shift the argument away from whatever it was you were arguing about to say, ah, yes, but I think you'll find five minutes ago you said that bananas would be bendy. And that's not what you were arguing about. You were arguing about whether or not leaving the European Union would be a good idea. So I know how hard it is to admit that you're wrong. So, yeah, kudos to Steve. I've got a brilliant, torturous analogy for you. I've asked Keith to come up with a theme tune, but he hasn't had time. I quite liked it to the tune of the can-can. No? James O'Brien's torturous analogies. James O'Brien's torturous analogies. They're the only words I've got so far. Um, I, I will share it with you after we pick the brains of Christian, who is in Stuttgart. Christian, where were we? Hi, James. You wanted to know how this happened, yes. Brexit. I, I have my own theory. Basically, it's that we've never really confronted in Britain our colonial past, uh, as the Germans did with the, the atrocities in the Second World War. Mm. Uh, there's a pre-Second World War German, and there's a German after it. They, they don't even use the first person when they speak about pre-1945. And that's because we went from 250 years of basically raping countries of their mineral resources and basically anything we could get our hands on. And uh, all that wealth came mostly directly to London. And we never really confronted the evils that we did within that 250 years because we went directly from that to the First World War, to the Second World War, and then we presented ourselves on the world stage as heroes who saved the world from the terrible Nazi regime, which, of course, it was. Go on. And, and that's how we, we've never, we should... Well, that does, I don't... Uh, well, wait, I hang on. Think... Where's the leap from that? I mean, uh, I, I think that you're probably right to to conjure I, up that, okay. that rose-tinted rose I... image of Britain I'm has 55... been... Yeah, go on. Sorry. I'm, I'm little... OK, sorry. But that's straight away. But I'm 55 years old, and I remember the horrible 70s when Pakistanis and Indians started coming in large numbers to England. We should have greeted those people as our brothers and sisters. You know, I, I realise that now, but we didn't. We treated them terribly. It was treated them as terribly, and we should be thankful to them because before this 250-year period, we had nothing. So we, well, I think, uh, I, 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 I kind of, I, don't, I haven't found anything that you say objectionable, um, but I don't quite see the links yet. So, you're, I mean, you're, you're describing not all Leave voters, but you're describing the ones who, who do have xenophobia or, 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 or jingoistic tendencies. How could a country that ruled a third of the world then complain about having foreign people in their country? Yeah, so you are, you're, you're, addressing, you're addressing the Brexit votes that were built entirely upon concerns about immigration. Mostly. I think, yeah. I think it was a, a racist... Uh, it was a racist but vote. There, but there's no way everyone who voted Leave is a racist. Th these, by the way, are the times I waste my breath completely. <laughs> yeah, OK, OK. But, but it is not true. I've got friends who voted Leave and they are not racist. They didn't think that immigration needed to be changed, but they wanted somehow... I can't even remember anymore. I must ring them after the show. But they thought we'd be able to do trade deals with... Oh, I can't remember. This is Either you have a racist or you have the people that believe in this wonderful colonial past, which, which is in a world that doesn't even exist anymore. You can't do that. You can't I, march into I, other countries. I, I, think, I think perhaps one or two of my friends who... who um, voted to leave might fit into that wonderful colonial past that you describe, but they wouldn't describe it thus. They, they, and that rule, Britannia, Britannia rules the waves, uh, you know, it, it's, it's not a dangerous thing if you're trying to um, drum a country up to go to war or to send your sons to die in a battle between two royal cousins, then you need to have a kind of blind, unquestioning patriotism in place. But if you're doing it to get out of a trading block with supranational self-interest at its heart yeah that that is a really good analysis actually thank you 10.55 is the time lee is in hull lee what would you like to say morning james hello mate um just uh, obviously i was a, a, a leave voter uh um, it's not obvious it's not obvious things, <laughs> <laughs> and then looking at how things have gone uh well it's david davis Literally doing about six hours work in two years. Four, mate. Um, four. Get it right. Well, four. Sorry, do yeah. Sorry, I, I'm bogging no. him a little bit there. Right. Um, Theresa May uh, standing by her guns when it could possibly cripple the country. Yes. Um, it's yeah. I'm, I, I, I regret not listening to to people. My, my but, wife but not listening a, to who, Lee? That's the thing. I, I do think it's easy to rewrite history. And, and I, 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 there, there, there's a, I wrote a line recently about who would you put on the other end of the seesaw? The, the, the ones that matched the passion and the rhetoric and the 
and the ludicrous tub thumping of your of your Farages and your Johnsons and your and your Hannans. There there weren't any because they didn't realise they needed to. It's almost as if you're a Actually, university professor and you didn't realise that you had to actually argue about your field of expertise with that spotty little prat who's just arrived in his first ever lecture. Absolutely, yeah, I agree. With, I, I think it was on, on both sides of the coin. I think obviously they, they were, you were kind of getting talked down to more than you yes. were trying to get educated. Or, or um, sorry to interrupt you and possibly talk down to you, but or you were being told <laughs> that you were being talked down to when you weren't being talked down to. But the idea yeah. that it was really, really easy to understand and really, really easy to vote against was sold to you by the same people that were telling you the complicated truth-tellers were somehow condescending and sneering at you and ignoring your legitimate concerns. Absolutely. Now, I, I, my, as my wife will uh, attest to, I'm, I'm very stubborn. <laughs> So when, when she, she's a, a, a corporate solicitor, so when she's telling me it's, it'll be bad, and I'm saying, no, I'm not better than you do, yes. with me being, she, with her with the degrees, me being a scaffolder with her, nothing really. Um, I, I knew better than she did. And, and my, my vote, as your previous caller said, that racist vote, it wasn't a racist. My no. vote was nothing to do with, with, with immigration. No. It was... It was it was bigger a bigger picture than that. Yes. Um, but yeah, it's when did the, what made the scales what made the scales fall from your eyes then? Um, like I said, David Davis when he, after two years when he, he said he, when he literally didn't have a clue what was going on. Yeah. Um, Theresa May with checkers and like I said, now she's she's they've pretty much shot her out the water. But instead of that, instead of Theresa May saying, oh, "Well, I'll rethink it," mm. she's standing by. And, and I think generally, like, Boris Johnson is a buffoon. He's, he's literally... What all, he, all he's doing, for me, Boris Johnson now is standing by watching Theresa May hang herself, and then he's just going to try and shift in... With, for, with, for the the noose, with the noose that he did more to make than anybody else in British politics. Absol absolutely, absolutely. He's, he's Obviously, the thing with his, his marriage and everything the other week, I think he's clear and shift ready to, to dive right in. Um, but I think all Brexit's done for, for the full government is just underline how inept our MPs truly are. Yes. I, I think they paid a fortune to do, to do a job and clearly they can't do it. Well, I, I do think that David Davis should pay back the ministerial part of his salary for the two years in which he was Secretary of State for leaving the European Union. The, the, I mean, genuinely, I, I know it's a bit pointless exercise, um, but, but if, if he only really did four hours of meetings with Barnier during that two-year period, at the end of which he came up with a new plan which was so awful that you, you, well, it's the European research group were too embarrassed to publish it or was that jacob's plan that was jacob's plan that they were too embarrassed to publish after blowing the trumpets i think davis is going to unveil his plan this week two years in the job resign in essentially disgrace because you've achieved absolutely diddly squat and then you somehow think that you're allowed to heckle from the sidelines about how the people on the stage are now getting it wrong I think we'll do a bit more on this. And they're still at it. James Brokenshire, housing minister, still at it in the news bulletin there, de de describing an absolutely unachievable goal. Describing that it's not really a unicorn anymore, what is it? What else? What's the sort of mythical creature that's not as exciting as a unicorn? That would be ridiculous. Mermaids are much more exciting than unicorns. Actually, that could be our third hour today. What's, what would you rather have, a mermaid or a unicorn? Don't be weird and pervy. It's got a, ooh, a dragon. Yeah, but I want something that's not as cool as a unicorn, but is mythical. Like, I don't know, a leprechaun. So James Brokenshire promising leprechauns are going to be delivered to everybody in the country by Christmas. Chequers is still viable. Chequers was never viable. Chequers hasn't been viable since the European Union came into existence, precisely because the four freedoms will always be indivisible. Even the Canada Plus Plus that they're currently spouting in an attempt to get you to stop asking difficult questions and asking them why all the things they said were going to happen haven't happened. Canada has agreed to abide by European Union regulations on, on all the stuff that it sends into the European Union. So unless they're going to have two or three separate production lines for products so they, they can send into the well-regulated, safe and uh, citizen-prioritising single market and then if they want to flog stuff into dangerous, uh, unregulated markets they can have a different production line which doesn't maybe use as much glue or put as many screws in things so they're more likely to fall apart. That, that, that's the bottom line and there's no services on the Canada deal either. Everything that they try to sell to you is nonsense. And there is... We've got James Brokenshire. So here's, here's, here is a government minister today. 
we remain positive as to what can be achieved. Obviously, we prepare for all outcomes, and we don't expect or want to see a no deal delivered. But ultimately, we remain focused on the Chequers Agreement and getting that positive outcome for our country. You've literally, literally been told by everybody that you would need to green light the Chequers Agreement that it's a no-goer. You've not just been told that yesterday, pal. You've been told that for two and a half years. And you still come out with this claptrap. And it's not because... Here is the really charitable analysis of what's going on now, OK? And I, and I happen to think it's probably a bit true. I don't think that, that, that someone like Brokenshire is a spiv or a snake oil salesman. I don't think he's one of the con artists. But he is a government minister, and he has to say something, right? You, he has to say something. So he can't say, I don't know. He can't say, we've all gone to hell in a handcart. He's a government minister, not a backbencher. So he can't say things that are completely pie in the sky. He has to say things he knows not to be true, but as mildly and as plausibly as possible. Otherwise, what do you do in an interview? What do you do in an interview when all you've got is checkers, nobody wants checkers, the people that need to agree to checkers have said they're never going to agree to checkers, and you're in a television studio being asked, what happens now? I don't know what else you can do except sort of start the stopwatch and say, well, we're going to stick with checkers. But, no, 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 we're going to have a positive. Obviously, we, we have to be positive as to what can be achieved, and we have to prepare for all possible scenarios. But what they can never say is, listen, there was never, ever any chance whatsoever of getting an arrangement superior to what we already had. That was never, ever possible. They can't say that. Ed Vasey, who I like the look of, um, although these are very strange times and everything's relative, he said something on the telly a few months ago that has stayed in my mind ever since. He said this. Positive as to what can be achieved. Obviously, we prepare for all outcomes, and we don't expect or want to see a... No, no, he didn't. Ed Vasey said this. We remain... I mean, discipline has completely broken down in the parliamentary party, so no one tells anyone off because there's no power anywhere. That, that is absolutely fascinating. I was surprised it didn't get picked up more. Listen to it again, because um, we, we played the Jungle remix earlier. I mean, discipline has completely broken down in the parliamentary party, so no one tells anyone off, because there's no power anywhere. So who would tell anybody off? Ed Vasey was a, was a minister, wasn't he, under David Cameron? Never, never got into the cabinet. Um, reportedly, because he made some jokes about David Cameron's wife at a party that David Cameron didn't like. I don't know if that's true, but it, it, it sort of makes me warm towards Ed Vasey a bit. It sounds quite human. So th th this is two. One former minister, one current minister. And I, I think right in the middle of these two sound bites, pennies should drop. Uh, Ed Vasey first. I mean, discipline has completely broken down in the parliamentary party, so no one tells anyone off because there's no power anywhere. Which means if no one's getting told off because there's no power anywhere, another minister can go on the television or the radio and talk undiluted nonsense. We remain positive as to what can be achieved. Obviously, we prepare for all outcomes, and we don't expect or want to see a no deal d delivered. But ultimately, we remain focused on the Chequers Agreement and getting that positive outcome for our country. Uh, absolute nonsense. I mean, I mean literally, pencils uh, at dawn. Nonsense, 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 nonsense on stilts. That's the phrase I was looking for. I don't know quite where pencils at dawn came from. Nonsense on stilts. But there's no leadership, you see. So he doesn't get disciplined or, or, or hauled over the coals. And the bottom line, what's becoming absolutely clear now, very simply, is that none of them can ever say that this deal that we're going to do, whatever the deal may be, is worse than what you've got. Because that is denying the will of the people or whatever the current phrase du jour may be. And, and ever since I've been telling you this for two and a half years, and I, I can't believe it still needs spelling out, there is nothing that will be better, right? They can't tell you that because they have charged themselves or the vote has charged them with delivering something that is different. So they can deliver something that is different, but they can't deliver something that is different and better. But they can't tell you it can't be better, so they have to keep banging on about how it's different. But when they take what is different but not better to the people who need to agree to it and they turn around and say, sorry, that's too good. That's still too, you're still cherry picking. Cherry picking is a phrase that we never see. If you want to understand the fundamental disconnect between continental European coverage of Brexit and British media coverage of Brexit, those two words are at the very heart of it. 
the two words that absolutely explain the gulf in perception and reality between the EU27 and Brexit Britain. Those two words are cherry picking. Donald Tusk yesterday did something I thought was a little childish on Instagram, where he offered Theresa May a slice of cake and then put a caption on his Instagram post saying, ah, no cherries. And we don't really get that in this country, do we? What's he doing now? Is he taking, what's he on about with cherries? But the whole point of the EU's position has always been you can't cherry pick. You can't take the bits that you like and jettison the bits that you don't like any more than you can... Uh, make up your own rules when you join any organisation at all, from a, from a gym right through to Netflix. You don't get to make up your own rules. That's what the cherry picking is about, and there is the gulf, the gulf between reality and Brexity. Cherry picking. And, I, I mean, how Theresa May has ended up in this mess is becoming increasingly hard to understand. A lot of love coming in for Stephen Benfleet and Lee in Hull, two men who, who voted Leave for perfectly reasonable reasons but have now realised the epic error of their ways. And, and, frankly, everybody with a functioning cerebral cortex should be where Stephen Lee are today. But I'm enduringly fascinated by the people who aren't. Um, here's one. Can you please sack James? He's a disgusting traitor to 17.4 million people. Thank you for that, Richard. Um, and this from Julie. For balance. James, we do love you, but during the referendum we were screaming at the radio because you actually sat painfully on the fence. We're so glad you are where you are now. We are terrified about the consequences for vulnerable people. Yeah, I'm sorry about that, Judy. I, 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 I've got a horrible feeling that the reason I did that was because I was working at the BBC at the time and I was conscious of the impartiality that was required there. It was a ludicrous, it was a ludicrous attempt, frankly, on my part to keep two separate plates spinning. But I, I got a feeling you're right, actually. If I hadn't been conscious of impartiality necessary for another job that I did at the time, um, then possibly I'd have been a little bit more on the ball about the realities of Brexit in this job. So I, I probably do owe you an apology for that. You'd be delighted to hear that. Um, actually, no, I'll, I'll save that surprise for next week. It's 11.12. Lloyd is in Neasden. Lloyd, what would you like to say? Hi, James. How are you doing? I'm all right. I didn't send you to sleep then. Did you, can, can you remember why you rang in, Lloyd? Um, kind of like. I was, I, was, I was starting to write it down, actually, because I thought he's going to go off for ages. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's what I do, mate. You should be used to it by now. What's on your mind? <laughs> OK, before we go any further, I want to I wanna congratulate you on your constant... No, not constant, your regular reference. Someone will say... You all say something like but, and you go, but here's the big but. Mm. I like big but. And then you don't go any further. And I always laugh because I know where you got that from. So I find that <laughs> hilarious every time you do it. But, I'm <laughs> glad to be of service. <laughs> yeah, because unless you're into old school rap and stuff, you, know, you, just, you just don't get it. But I like, I like I've got a lot, of niche, a lot of niche audience work. That's why I like to keep, 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 keep it but, but anyway, before we digress, mm. I think, I've said this to you before, I think a lot of it is about fans. I think Nigel Farage was a bit of a a bit of a character, a bit of a, a bit of a loon for a while, and then when people start to see the following, people like Liam Fox and certain other people who weren't really they weren't really known as far as I was concerned, mm. but suddenly they're up north saying, "I never thought I'd get such a rapturous applause and greeting because they were now on superstar podium." Do you know what I mean? Like when mm. David Cameron punched the hair with Sarkozy, sort of thing. Do you know what I mean? I think so. Yes. Yes, yeah, so I so I thought to myself, and another thing that what I've noticed is a lot of reference to like Germany and the war, and even people who seem to be a bit younger are talking about Germany rule. This like a, a, a hatred for Germany seems mm. to be whipped up in this whole sort of thing. Do you know what I mean? Yes, I do know what you mean. It's uh, I mean this is I think the the the, the non-racist but but post-imperial position that that Christian in Stuttgart described it it goes back to the empire but it also has echoes of the second world war and and the european union in many ways certainly under churchill's predictions would have been a bulwark against european wars it would have been something that provided a, a, an enhanced possibility of security but if you spent your I, did, you, did you read commando magazines when you were a kid do you remember commando yeah. And it was all got in Himmel, and uh, for you, Tommy, the war is over. And all, all, all that, and it was great, and I loved them. I, and I, I've got, I've still got quite a lot at home, actually. But it, it was, it never, it never struck me as something that um, still applied today. I, I realise now when I look at people like Douglas Carswell and Daniel Hannan, that they think life is still like a commando comic strip, don't they? 
I, I, I think the analogy is like back to those those Japanese guys who were found on an island in like 1981, thinking that the war still going yes, on. Yes, exactly, exactly. Uh, that, that, that's that, the that's sort of thing that, and what I what I realised as well when I when this first started kicking off a couple of years ago, I used to hear you shoot people down. It was like ducks from a uh, I don't no, know, no. From I, would gen- I would gently lead them to the promised land of enlightenment and realisation, Lloyd. I, well, I never no, shot well, anybody I, I, down. I don't I, know what you I, mean. I, 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 one time, you 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 had you had a uh, you had a line that you used constantly, and, and it got. So I remember someone actually saying to you, no, you need to stop that sort of line. It's which really one good, was it? But you need to stop which, it. The one where you say, "How would it? what would you be able to do tomorrow after the thing? And people just fell down constantly. Those are the days. That. Do, you remember, yeah. do you remember when that was surprising? <laughs> remember when you'd hear well, people go, well, actually, James, I can't mention any. I can't, I've got absolutely nothing. You've done it day in, day out. And it, was, it was like... It, it was, but this was, was my dawn. This was my James, penny that, drop. That, that was for me. That was when I realised things were much, much worse than I had, as Julian Suffolk points out, than I realised in the run-up to the referendum. I was a bit of an idiot, mate. I based my position on Brexit on the toxicity of a lot of the people lining up on the other side, on the Leave side. I, I looked at them and I thought, well, you're an adulterous lying fool. Fraud. You're, you're a bit of a fascist. Um, you're very thick. You're very strange. I'm not voting with your lot, and I don't like the others as much either. But uh, at least they're not fascists and, and frauds. They're just sort of inadequate politicians. So I based it on that mostly. And then afterwards, when people started queuing up to say, "Oh, it's brilliant," and I'd say, "Why?" and they'd go, mm, "Um, oh." Uh, that's when it got serious for me, Lloyd. After the vote, and I'm really embarrassed about that. But but another thing I noticed at first, when when it first kicked off, a lot of people they were jumping up and, and you were saying, well, what's the problem with this? And they'd say, yeah. well, I can't do this, and they say, well, you can. Well, yeah. I can't do this, and you can. Yeah. And then after a while, they just stopped phoning you. The masses stopped phoning you because I think that they were, they, were, they did they really didn't want to hear the truth, so don't phone him because he will just he will just put you in your place. Yeah. Well, there it is. Please let's. I have something else to talk about soon on those occasions, but right now I think things are going to get a hell of a lot worse before they get better. And by the way, Lloyd, I do like big butts and, and the clamorous calls for people on one side of reality to stop pointing out the terrible mistake that's been made by people on the other side of reality grow ever louder, but um, quite a few people getting in touch today to um, express, I suppose, a degree of buyer's remorse. 0345 606 0973. The thing I can't do yet... Um, and Lloyd made things a little bit personal, so I'll, I'll just say this and then we'll move on. But the thing I can't do yet is work out how. And I appreciate that for, for some people who are capable of understanding the, the, the scale of the mistake that they've made, I, I'm, I'm not necessarily the most helpful midwife for that baby to be born. But if you see that phrase there, buyer's remorse. It's a great phrase, buyer's remorse. So if you do suffer buyer's remorse, even if you're not ready to articulate it yet, it's still bubbling inside rather than something that you're going to be able to to share outside. How? how and I'll take advice on this, actually. Maybe not over the phone, but if you want to send me an email. How, how do you... How does someone like me avoid the phenomenon that seems to be occurring now where anger is not being directed at the seller? So buyer's remorse means you've bought a pup. You should get cross with the man who sold you the pup, right? You should be getting cross with the people who sold you the thing that you regret buying. What we seem to be seeing at the moment is is, is a double-pronged assault upon truth and reality. So the first prong of that assault involves people thinking that the reason why they've turned out to have bought a pup is all the fault of the people that told them not to buy it. That's really strange, isn't it? When you actually break it down, oh, it's all Remainer's fault. What? So here's a bloke selling snake oil or, uh, I don't know, what's a big sort of con type thing that people routinely buy? But the dodgy perfume on Oxford Street. There's a bloke selling dodgy perfume on Oxford Street. Claims it's the real deal. Chanel, £2.50 a pop. Got a special consignment in from China, madam. It's a, it's a bit of a long story, but I can assure you this is the stuff what the Hollywood stars are wearing. And then there's a fella s- sort of walking past and sees this woman and thinks, well, she's from out of town. She's probably not seen these con men in, in, in 
uh, action before, and he and he says to her, "Don't be, don't be silly, man. The, 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 you know, it's it's cat urine. You get that home, it won't be the stuff that he's just squirted on you, or the bag that he hands you from the stage won't have the stuff in it that he told you would be in it. It's, it's going to have blue passports and fish in it." And normally, I guess if you didn't buy it, you'd turn around and say thank you to the person who told you not to. But if you did buy it and you got it home, and it was some manky old nonsense not the wonderful product that you thought you were buying, why would you get cross with the fellow who told you that it was manky old nonsense all along, instead of getting cross with the bloke who sold you the manky old nonsense? And how could anybody, genuinely, with an ounce of self-respect, attempt to persuade themselves that the reason why they've ended up buying manky old nonsense is because the people who told them it was manky old nonsense didn't believe enough that the manky old nonsense might somehow turn out to be Chanel Number no. 5 perfume? That's where we are. I've got another analogy for you as well. But I'll talk to Matthew first. He's probably nodded off. Matthew, what's going on? James, I'm still here. Thanks for taking my call. Um, I'm going to touch a little bit on what a gentleman from Stuttgart said earlier. Yes. You'll, um, I'll touch on the commando bit. So um, I'm sure you know where the name commando comes from. But do you well, want me to go in a small... No. I mean, it's a... It's a, it's a term for a certain type of soldier. That's why they named the comics Commando Comics. Yeah. Well, it, it We're not talking about Joey Tribbiani's underwear habits, but yeah, I, no, no, I don't no, want to no, steer no. you towards Brexit, even yeah, through no, the it's lenses. Related to, it's related to Brexit. I'll, I'll, I'll oh. tie it up pretty quickly. So Commando comes from Boer Commando, which is what the Boers, now Afrikaners in South Africa, called their military forces. Okay. They're basically classic guerrillas on horseback. Um, and so Spion Cop, which of course the cop in Liverpool is named after, was one of the battles where they they handed the British Army a heavy defeat. Um, and in a nutshell, they wouldn't give up. And so to win the war, someone called Kitchener of I want you to fight for mm. Britain fame Country needs um, you. basically burned down farms, barbed wire everywhere, and chucked a whole lot of Boer women and children to concentration camps. So the, the thing is, is the British Empire, I believe, is the British Empire of the Magna Carta, of abolishing slavery, all of these good, good things. But there's also the dark side. Yeah. And so... Um, your other gentleman, I believe, was a bit pessimistic, but it's basically it's it, just a fuller reading of history and economic, military and economic power and history would give a fuller view of the world. And I think... Yeah, but a lot, a lot of these of, people, I mean, a lot of the loudest voices on the other side are, are among the most ignorant people I've ever encountered. I don't think they've got sure. a sophisticated understanding of... No, that, that, what I'm saying is it's a failing, I think, of the UK as, as a country... Um, to have proper lessons in history okay. and civics. So if you're looking for that, what you'd describe as the emotional drive, the belief exactly. that's driven by emotion that we can somehow defy reality, then you're looking at a kind of intuitive sense that, that of, of exceptionalism. You're, you're describing a, a warped history written by the winners that has persuaded the more credulous and less educated that there is somehow something fundamentally innate about being British that means we'll get one over on Johnny Foreigner even if, I don't know, even if all of the evidence suggests that we won't. And that's not racist, but it is, it is jingoistic, perhaps. Yeah, so the Americans had now, because they're in the pomp, sort of still, have this idea that they're the indispensable nation, and I think Britain is recovering from that concept. And it's, the empire is a it's a big, complicated, beautiful thing, and mm. a narrow view of it is going to lead people into wrong thinking about the world. A, because Britain still isn't still an empire, but B, because it's just an incorrect view of where Britain came from and where Britain is now. And if you just understanding, even if you disagree on the moral points, just understanding how the empire underpinned the economic power of Britain would lead you to understand why Britain needed to join the EU and to understand that we're not the hegemon or the colossus of the world economy anymore, that actually we are an equal partner in still the richest area in the world mm. when you look at GDP, and that actually also in the past we got rich by taking from force or controlling places like Africa, Asia. You know, for the Chinese, the opium wars are not ancient history because they lost. 
Yes. For Britain, it's easy to forget. But for China, that's why they were big up about Hong Kong. And that's why Spain cares about Gibraltar, because it's, it's almost a stick in the eye of Spain constantly. It's not that Gibraltar's bad. It's just that Spain it's a reminder. constantly. Yes. It's yes. a constant reminder. So the idea that Spain is going to do us a favor when a, there's a relic of the colonial past and, you know, Britannia ruled the waves there, still thumbing its nose at, say, Spanish tax laws, is just madness. It's just wrong. Uh, well, yeah, you're not going to get much. I didn't know quite where we were going then, but the history lesson was really helpful, to be honest with you. I didn't know that about the South African um, origins of, of, of commando as a military term. And, and I, I guess, Matthew and I now share a, a brief moment to bang our heads against the brick wall that is Brexit rhetoric. Um, because as Oliver points out in a rather adroit tweet, uh, the, the reason why you get angry with the guy who told you that you were buying cat urine is because being conned because you're dumb is one thing, but being conned because you're dumber than everybody else, that's, that's hard to swallow. And Deborah takes up the point. My dad got really angry with me in a pub when mum told me Microsoft had phoned him to say there was a problem with his PC. I told him he'd been scammed and that he should inform the police, and he literally shouted at me in public, I have not been scammed! He was very helpful! Which I guess is, is not a million miles away from what some people listening to this programme still think about Boris Johnson and Jacob Rees-Mogg and Ian Duncan Smith and Nigel Farage and Liam Fox and David... D I have not been scammed. He was very helpful. I